um, the points that we're going to be covering are sort of how to overcome the trap of selective listening, um, red flags that typically go unidentified or are lurking uh, in your opportunities, and then missing or not having or having the incorrect stakeholders involved in deals. These are all issues that we deal with. So the first question I'd probably like to ask is why is it crucial for leaders to understand the health of their pipeline? Sort of a basic question. I think at least people generally speaking understand this, but <clears throat> having visibility in your sales pipeline helps, you know, it helps a team monitor the progress of their efforts. Uh, it gives them an accurate picture of what needs to happen to boost the, the company's revenue. And then improving the sales results means more money for not just the company, but also um, the rep as well, who earns that commission. And then the sales pipeline also helps us identify any obstacles hindering the progression of that sale. And it's really the lack of visibility into the pipeline um, that leaves us with this opportunity cost, which is, you know, what are the problems that are associated with that leaky pipeline? And it really comes down to things that sort of impact both upstream and downstream, which is 57% of reps don't accurately forecast their pipeline. 53% of all forecasted deals do not close. And 46% of reps do not hit their quota. And this is across the industry. This is taken from CSO Insights, which has pulled a lot of these analytics. So when you think about that massive opportunity cost, how do we make an impact against that? And it's really identifying the areas that are causing that leaky pipeline. The first of which is what I mentioned right at the onset, which is that selective listening piece. So why is selective listening a problem? And, and maybe more importantly, if you're not familiar with it, what is selective listening? So selective listening um, is a listening technique that filters input to achieve the listener's goal. And this happens to all of us. It's actually just innate in what we do. Uh, and it's good for a lot of things. It helps us do a lot of things. But from a sales perspective, it can become incredibly problematic. We call it happy ears, as you can see up on the slide. So when you're engaging in a conversation as a salesperson using selective listening, what you're really doing is you're solely focused on achieving your own goals instead of creating value and solving for the problem that led the prospect to you in the first place. And you can't really prove like a negative, like there's no ability to prove a negative. So there's not like a lot of great stats around, you know, the impact of selective listening. So what we really need to do is, is like look at the gaps to understand where the impact really exists. And so what I want to focus on is really four key details. There's, there's some other information that we can dive into, but I really want to dig into stats around what reps think they're good at as it relates to listening. So, 83% of reps say they listen to the prospect's needs. 82% try to provide value to the prospect. 77% try to be helpful in their initial outreach. And 72% tailor their pitch based on the customer's needs. These are sort of like the four areas that actually some of the top areas that reps think they're very good at as it relates to listening. What, what does that actually mean? How does that translate from the prospect's point of view? And when we think about that from the prospect's point of view, what they really think, that's when you start to understand where the selective listening has, has created an issue, um, has created this dissonance between what the sales reps think is happening and what the prospect, the person you're trying to close, actually happens. So let's dig in a little bit there. So if you remember 83%, of sales reps say they listen to the prospect's needs. In actuality, see if this works here, prospects say um, that sales reps listen to their needs only 62% of the time, which is about a 21% gap. It is exactly 20% gap, which is which is not great, um, but it's not terrible either. It's, it's sort of the next few stats here where 82% of the time the, the rep tries to provide value to the prospect, but we see that the prospect says this only happens only 34% of the time. So now we see this massive, massive gap in what is actually being presented to the prospect from their point of view. And 77% of reps 
try to be helpful on sales calls, right? But the the prospects say this only happens right around 44% of the time. And then lastly, the sales reps say that they tailor their pitch to the customer's needs 72% of the time. And the actuality is that the prospects feel this only happens 37% of the time. So when you think about this, this creates sort of a cascading effect right away. One, the prospect doesn't feel like they're being valued, which creates trust issues, which down the road means that deal is probably not gonna close because they don't trust you even if you are recommending a solution that is going to achieve their outcome, there's this lack of trust there that, that really starts to penetrate that deal and it becomes a problem. So how do we fix selective listening? There are, there are some practical methods that we can start to employ. Um, the first of which is a technique called mirroring. And mirroring is simply repeating what the prospect said back to them, usually with an inflection of a question which gets them to open up a little bit more about what they're talking about. The other piece of that is, is confirming that you've heard them correctly, which is sort of that, that same technique, just used a little bit differently. So you know that they know you're engaged in that conversation. Um, the next piece here is, is asking a relevant follow-up question. Even if that question is not necessarily uh, ideal to the, the outcome of the sale, it will help people know that you are engaged with them, that you're actively listening in that conversation. Another piece is, is you know, utilize team selling. You can always rely on a second team member or a manager to be on that call to act as that second set of ears. Because even if you think you have like those first two pieces mastered as much as you think you're present as a sales rep, what you're really thinking about is trying to steer this conversation towards a sale, which is fine. I mean, that's that's what you're getting paid to do but you're coming up with preconceived objections and overcoming them and really thinking sort of two to three steps ahead. Um, and so having that second set of ears will always help fill in the gaps. And a very, a very easy one, but I think it's important to simply talk less and listen more. So research shows us that on average, the best reps, and this is analytical data pulled from Chorus, that the best reps um, on average have a 40 to 60 talk to listen ratio. Now, I wanna be very clear that this is not something that you should lock your reps into because if, if your best rep doesn't follow that particular 40 to 60, maybe it's 50-50, maybe it's the opposite 60-40, like he's still your best rep for a reason. But if you're having this issue, it's a great place to start, right? And then make use of sales tech plus AI. and this is really where things can start to happen where you can actually start to affect change because before you can affect change you have to identify that there's a problem and so what chorus does um, is it is it acts as a second listener recording everything that's happening on that call right transcribing it with natural language processing which is natural language processing created from a salesperson's point of view and utilizing a salesperson's vernacular and so the conversational intelligence literally turns those conversations into visual data, right? So we can actually see what the best reps are doing and we can compare it to the reps that are not performing as well. It's, it's more than just simply recording that call. What we can pull out of that is much more than just like, hey, a transcription. We can identify the roadblocks that a sales rep are encountering on calls, what customer objections have been fielded this week, which competitors are coming up consistently again and again on deals, and then other areas where the reps are experiencing trouble, like selective listening. And now what we can do is we can create trackers to find out trends within your sales team. So we can identify, again, what the best reps are doing, and then affect change by modeling that behavior across teams. Because as much as you wanna practice mirroring and asking relevant, engaging follow-up conversations, you can only do that so much by yourself pretending. But when you can take a snip of your best rep and model that across your team so they can get a visual representation and actually hear and see the body language of, of how that's working, it, it makes it a lot easier for those reps to come up to that same page, okay? And then what else that allows you to do is it allows you to track red flags within a deal, utilizing conversational intelligence. So 
Uh, I'm going to ask a question, and I think you guys should be able to raise your hands. And I'm actually going to phrase it a little bit differently than this. It's not, you know, can you identify red flags? It's who here would say that they're struggling identifying the red flags in your team's pipelines right now? This is a very difficult thing to do. Like, even if you think you have a very good handle on it, depending on the size of your teams or your organizations, that just is a, it's a mountain that seems impossible to climb. And I'd like to start by just kind of talking through some common red flags or really why it's so important to identify red flags first, then we'll get into the common red flags. So what happens is these missed red flags can lead to that cascading effect across the sales, really the organization itself with, again, inaccurate forecasting, missed quota, financial instability, strategic objectives that are, that are missed or just all together, like it's just not possible anymore. And what are red flags that both we look for as an organization, but sort of across the board are some lag red flags that you should be looking for? So first and foremost is um, understanding when competitors are mentioned in the call. So we actually analyzed a little over 2 million sales conversations, and we discovered that only one third of competitive deals are marked as such in their CRM, and that's a massive disparity. And it also helps to understand like when they're mentioned in the stage of the deal. Early on, it's actually a pretty good thing because it means that the prospect is actually engaged in your conversation and is taking this seriously. Later on, it means that you're actually in a competitive situation and you need to sell your services against theirs. Are budget or pricing concerns mentioned? Have next steps been set? This is actually one that we use religiously internally here because if, if a next step has not been set on a calendar, then how do you how can you forecast that deal is it real like that needs to happen to understand is this deal real is this deal progressing another big one uh, is lack of communication at the end of a deal cycle if a deal is forecasted this month but there's no communication on it for the last two weeks is that or is that deal real right so i think about this as a sales rep if i'm reviewing my pipeline past or present, right? Going back to utilizing conversational intelligence and how it can help specifically with momentum. What I can do is I can actually look at my pipeline and add a risk tracker to a call. So automatically that will identify any risks to the deal. And then it's going to show it, them to me and transcribe for, but context is incredibly important. Like we can read something but body language and the verbalization, the, antena the, the inflection that those individuals use can, can mean that. So you can actually click on that transcription right within the, the platform in a single pane of glass, and you can hear now the context of what's going on, and I can now make sure that my solution aligns with their desired outcome. And if it does not, then clearly my deal is at risk, but now I know it, and I can make sure I'm following up with that individual with the actual solution that real, that basically aligns to that desired outcome. But more importantly, what it's doing is it's showing that I listen to them, right? You're already starting to build that trust. And it's something that I can use for deals that maybe have gone cold. Like, why did they go cold? And, and maybe I didn't have uh, a solution that aligned to the desired outcome because I'm human and I use selective listening. But now I have some customized personal content that I can reach out to them with and hopefully re-engage them as a prospect um, if they're still interested in our product. Secondly, if a deal's in closing stage, like from a management level or higher up, but there's been no communication in the last week, is that deal really closing or is that rep just hoping to get that deal closed? So understanding how much communication is happening is really the key to understand, is this deal going to close? Which leads me to the last point, how many stakeholders are involved in this deal? So, on average, or I should even back this up, like, you know, do you know if you have the key stakers, stakeholders involved in your deals and, and how are you identifying those right now? And can you identify those? And when you start to add all of these things up, okay, I have one thing that I can, I can talk to the sales rep and try to affect change. Okay, well now I have to go out there and I have to figure out beyond that, are there any red flags that the, maybe the rep is missing or, or the management is missing? And, and now I have to also know like, okay, well, do I have all the key stakeholders involved? It, it starts to be this mountain, uh, this problem, this amalgamation that, that seems really possible to overcome. 
And, and I think you're going to see why conversational intelligence is so important and so, and so key to this and why people missing those forecasts is, is a very easy thing to do, but how we can have such a massive impact. So our research shows us that there are between five to seven different stakeholders involved in every closed one deal. The actual statistic is 6.7. Um, and missing stakeholders are a very common reason for a lot of promising deals to get derailed, whether it's a stakeholder or an influencer. An influencer can gum up the works just as much as that key stakeholder. And so engaging a buying committee also does one thing very, very well. It increases trust because especially if you're saying the same things to all of the different stakeholders, there's no reason for them to doubt you because you have consistent messaging. So engaging them early with consistent messaging is incredibly key to getting everyone on board and pushing that deal across the finish line. So how do we confirm, but also involve stakeholders? The first piece is just to start early, right? That's the easiest. The, the second you have that inbound phone call, that outbound prospecting, that meeting, if it's just a singular individual, understanding who they are, their position with the, in the company, and maybe learning even a little bit more of who those key stakeholders are. But then also, once you do that, you multi-thread, which means that is you start to communicate with these stakeholders as early as possible, getting them involved in the conversation, and then make use of data platforms like Zoom Info and even LinkedIn to understand, A, who these key stakeholders are. Like, is it just the CRO or do we need to get the VP of sales involved? Does the CFO having any decision making because it's, it's, a, it's a budgetary need? Like understanding who those people are and getting them involved quickly is always good. And then utilizing technology solutions that offer the stakeholder visibility in a single dashboard. And that sort of goes back to kind of what we're talking about. How do I make sure I affect change at all of these levels with all of these potentially disparate solutions but how do I make it, how do I make sure that I'm, I'm loading this all into one single pane of glass so I can affect change across the sales organization from the very bottom to the very top? And that's where momentum and conversational intelligence comes in. It's probably one of the most important pieces to affect a change in a sales organization. Which brings us to basically the summary, right? So making sure your team's pipeline is healthy is is a big task it's asking prospects customers engaging questions acting in active listening as opposed to selective listening it's identifying red flags it's what are the most common red flags that i see context is important reviewing phone calls and including key stakeholders like i mentioned this is a when you add it all up it sounds like this massive massive mountain that's impossible to climb but when you add in a conversational intelligence piece, which is really imperative, you can identify in one pane of glass the best practices for your sales reps to replicate, deal risks that are involved in the deals that they have, both from a, a singular account level or rep level, your management level, and even your CRO level. You can identify the amount of communication that's happening, and you can do all this based on opportunity stage, size, team, uh, again, communication, actual length of where you want that placed, and then also understand the stakeholders and the amount of people that are involved in conversations. And so now you can reduce that massive opportunity cost of that bad pipeline uh, attribution and missed quotas because we're starting to affect change and we're identifying these things utilizing conversational intelligence that is actionable, right? That is actually actionable as opposed to just transcription first question uh how do we minimize speaking to the wrong person uh, and the kind of a follow-up how can i minimize calling leads with inaccurate data you really kind of need to go back and and use data platforms right i mean i'm going to be biased and say that zoom info is the best and g2 crowd will agree with that so the first thing you have to understand is obviously your addressable market and the people you're you're trying to reach out to um, but you can also use LinkedIn for that is understanding titles that you want to reach out to. But if you're, if it's bad data, then I would recommend, uh, having a conversation with one of our account executives around either zoom info or chorus and how those things can relate and help you guys out. What CRMs does chorus integrate with? 
That is a good question. So right now, uh, Chorus integrates from a CRM perspective, and this means that you can find all of the information, all the transcription, all of that, the video in currently Salesforce and HubSpot. Dynamics, I believe, is a is on our roadmap for Q4. Excellent. Um, next question. What are some best practices to affect change using Chorus and Momentum for my sales team? It's a, it's a big mountain to climb. And so what you can essentially do is uh, in the Momentum piece, you can start to filter based on those deals. And where you feel like you have problems, and, and we'll help you set up some of those trackers, you can start to pick apart those areas where you think there might be problems and seeing that representation, right? And then hearing that representation and then how you would coach against that representation from a, and that's from a listening perspective. The next level is against red flags. Like you, it's pretty, it'll be pretty clear. Like, Hey, I'm, I'm not aligning to what they're looking to achieve or there are budget concerns or they're, you know, they're, they're saying something that is putting this deal at risk. I can now go out there with content, with their own words. You can even, if you want to copy and paste, you said this and, and now double down on your content, how you're going to affect the change and make them feel very comfortable, which again, is going to build trust. Um, and then at the, at the use of like the stakeholders, like we'll give you that representation. If, if, if there's the CEO involved and you've, there's heard mention of a CFO needs to be involved, or it's just, you know, this because of your deals, I need to go out there to those data providers that we utilize, hopefully it's zoom info and say, I need the CFO's information. I need to engage them in a the conversation. I need to let them know I'm talking to the CEO. And that'll help obviously progress that deal in a way that again, builds trust, but it obviously probably speeds that deal up as well. That's great. I really like that. Um, I will say, uh, I, I have one more question here. So if anyone else that's, that's on right now has another burning question, definitely drop that in the Q and a box. Uh, right now or forever hold your peace, I guess. But uh, the last question that I can see, uh, you mentioned um, that, you know, five to seven stakeholders uh, are involved in the average deal. What are some tactics for, you know, to help my reps make sure they aren't missing a key stakeholder? Maybe you're at, you've identified four or five and you're like, am I missing someone? What, what would you recommend? Yeah, so, I mean, this goes back to having, a really strong data provider uh, as the foundation for this, right? Because even, even Chorus can identify that stakeholder, but if you have no way to get in touch with those additional stakeholders, what you have to do is first and foremost, you have to go back out to the people that you've engaged in conversations with and ask for that introduction, which may or may not happen. Uh, they may not respond to you, but it, having that solid data provider will allow you to look for those individuals if it's Zoom info, we're gonna have an email and a direct dial almost every time and even a mobile phone number. So you can start engaging them in the conversation, bringing them up to date. Um, a lot of the times like on the call, we recommend like, hey, I'm, I wanna reach out to additional stakeholders or other any, any additional stakeholders involved, which will give you the direction. And then you use that as a way to, to reach out to those individuals. If the deal's cold, I mean, you just do it. Right. I mean, otherwise, a cold deal is a cold deal. If, if it's not going to close, you might as well shoot your shot and go after those people and see if you can shake something loose. That's great. I like that a lot. Um, and I did see there is one more question that came in. Um, how do I best internally champion chorus to increase user enthusiasm? That is a great question. So there's there's two thoughts to this one is you can leverage the course team and the training team, right? To help really try to build out that enthusiasm about what will be possible with chorus. Another way is to find a person that loves chorus internally and find out what they're doing to affect real change in their job. And that real change is going to catch fire. I can think about a specific instance with a rep that I was working with. I was running some random very random testing with Chorus, found a risk at a, at a company that he had. I reached out to him with a piece of information that I just also happened to be looking at, which was relevant. And he asked me, how did you know this? And I said, well, I just happened to be running a risk analysis on this deal because I'm running some testing. 
uh, and I have this relevant piece of content because it matters to exactly what they're saying. And so when you think about that, like that's kind of stuff that will catch fire. Oh, I can do this very quickly. Like it's it's not hard. I can do this easily. I I now have relevant content to reach out to. I don't have to be so, you know, I don't have to take all of these notes because of the transcription. Um, it's that excitement with the teams that'll get other people excited as well. So I would actually take both of those methodologies, account management and training team to train everyone up, that internal driver who's excited about all of these things and an actual real world representation of, of how it affects their job at their company. That's awesome. Um, kind of looking through here, I think we've touched on all the questions that I've seen come through. Uh, at this point, uh, Nate, I just want to give you an opportunity. Do you want to leave like one final takeaway or one final charge with everyone here? Yeah, so it, chorus, especially momentum, is one of those things that Honestly, when I was a sales rep, I wish I had. I just think about this all the time, especially for like going back on those cold deals, because I'm, I guarantee you there's, there's probably 80% of them where I was not providing the solution for the outcome that they were hoping to, to achieve. And at that point, it's sort of a race down to the dollar bottom. And if you have the cheapest price, okay. But most people don't sell in the cheapest price. They sell in the value. So I think about having that impact me when I was a sales rep, let alone looking at all of these statistics, like that have been so beneficial for me to then reach out to those individuals with that customized content. Hey, is this deal in play? We can help affect the change you're looking for.